Hey guys, welcome to No Tux Allowed. I am your host, Josh, and behind me you might happen to see some geckos if you're watching the video, but in the meantime, to comment on how beautiful these little two geckos that are probably not in focus right now are, I got this guy here named Big Pod. Aww, hello. Uh, and uh, to join us today, because we all know that he totally loves Open Sousa, and uh, you know, some other select uh, YouTubers that I won't mention, mention by name, uh, we have brought... <laughs> Uh, Brody Robertson with us, who's going to hopefully make our small podcast explode in viewership. Uh, you didn't send me a link to where people can even find this, so we'll see about that. <laughs> uh, that'll come later. <laughs> that'll come, I see. Yeah, come later. I see. And by the way, Brody Robertson has a, has a very creatively named YouTube channel, Brody Robertson. Of yes. course. Yes. Very creative because naming. Uh, naming your channel something that's not your name is difficult, so I didn't do it. I did well, it. I have had channels in the past with different names, but uh, this one, this one, no. I managed well, to make see, it work by by uh, using my internet name. <laughs> I managed to make it work by not actually picking the name for my channel. If you look at the, the channel history, my channel is actually pretty old. But at the same time, you have to realize that that YouTube channel came a year after I graduated high school, and I happened to be using the same username on my YouTube channel that I had for the computer login at school. <laughs> ten lead Shay. Yeah. Why ten? Uh, because that's the year I graduated. Huh. 2010. Um, or is it 1910? Yeah, it was 2010. <laughs> yeah, you, you're old enough. Yeah. Uh, I guess me and Bro like did not... Login. Were, way way younger <laughs> well you see i also have other channels too that uh, you might see me comment on every now and then mostly accidentally but hey uh those those are supposed to be secret but anyways uh big pod we got some big news yeah uh and you know uh big pod you know way more about this than i do and maybe brody knows a little bit more about it because you know i don't watch this space and i know that uh uh brody happens to know a thing or two about web development but uh, apparently, Open uh, Open Search has joined the Linux Foundation. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> at this insight. point, I should probably start talking. So, probably, Open Search yeah. is flexible, scalable open source platform for data intensive applications. At least that's what they say. They also hmm. say it's an open source enterprise gate search and observability suite that brings order to us actual data at scale. Essentially, it's a kind of fork from uh, Elasticsearch, mm -hmm. if I remember correctly. After Elasticsearch went, uh, it was one of the first ones that went the same way uh, recently Redis did, and the whole of HashiCorp projects, it went to BSL and Source Available. Mm -hmm. So, People forked it, and one of those forks is open search. It was, uh, I believe, for a long time maintained by AWS slash employees of AWS, and recently apparently joined Linux Foundation as a project, which is pretty cool. Yeah, so I'm gonna have the <clears throat> Linux Foundation announcement actually linked in the show notes here, so you can so you can read through some of this. That way, you can figure out a little bit more about uh, what Open Search Search is. But it's also got like a lot of testimonials about the the, the Open Search uh, Search Foundation as well from uh, ma many uh, names here. So like uh, Shansen Song, senior director at Uber, uh, Oscaris. I'm I'm sorry I'm butchering names here. <laughs> yeah, okay. good luck with yeah. that. Uh, Askari <laughs> Sarenma, CEO and founder of Avon, which I don't know what Avon even is, but hey, that's perfectly fine. And uh, you know, like uh, we got uh, Cedric Gregout from Canonical, and a couple a guy from DigitalOcean, uh, Greylog. So which uh, NetApp. That, yeah. Yeah. So uh, apparently, like it is used by some uh, fairly known companies. Yeah. And uh I think that ultimately this is a good thing because uh when when it comes down to like uh funding funding like open source, uh the the Linux Foundation is not lacking on income at all. Yeah. Uh compared to like other other groups that uh help that uh center around like fun funding open so open source. And uh 
I know that there's been some criticisms for like how the Linux Foundation uh, spends their money, especially from us uh, Linux desktop users. But uh, we have to realize that uh, a lot of the technologies that uh, th that they uh, support also might, while they might not directly impact you, uh, they do impact like the vast majority of people. And uh, yeah. we have to remember that most of most of uh, the usage for the Linux kernel is in these enterprise systems or like these servers, not necessarily like the desktop. Server and much. embedded is basically ninety percent of Linux usage. And more importantly, it isn't just funding that comes from Linux Foundation. It's also expertise in managing your projects. It's, well, infrastructure like uh, CICD and stuff like that. And uh, uh, connecting with different developers. And, uh, and we could say advertising, even though open source doesn't need that, that, that. But things you might have as a project a much easier time getting into conferences run by by Linux Foundation, essentially, like uh, CNCF's uh, KubeCon and Cloud Native Conference, which is probably one of the bigger conferences there is. So, yeah, it's, it's really good for, for the project. So, good for them. And, like... Uh, Open Tofu, Open Bow, and Valky, he joined Linux Foundation. They're go they're probably gonna have pretty good time, pretty good staying power now that maybe they couldn't have before. With sure, sure. Hall being on their own, even though it was as far as I know AWS. Yeah, yeah, you're not exactly on your own if you're being sponsored by AWS or sponsored by Amazon. That's a, yeah, it's, it's, but it's a bit different from like having a small development team. Yeah, yeah. but it's still, it's still, it's still kind of, kind of dependent on well, AWS. Let's remember, oh, yeah. and uh, you know, we also know that uh, the the you know the the search bar on Amazon.com is ever so useful and fantastic. So, uh, yeah, might might actually really. be the might actually be using Open Search in the background. <laughs> it it might bar. be. Uh, well, uh, if if I can talk about my experience with Open Search and I like to share this before that, I used it in past to support search. Yes. Basically, <laughs> you put data into that uh, into the database, which it's a database, mm -hmm. and then it probably does vector operations or something like that, and then you can use search queries on it and get like fuzzy find and stuff like that. It is also has been also used in past to store logs and then search across them. I haven't used it for that purpose because personally I find Grafana a much better experience. In combination of course with Loki. Well looking at the Wikipedia page here for open search it says that it uses a leucine based search engine, which is a uh... Which is uh, actually a Apache project. I yeah, don't know what Apache Lucene. Yeah, which uh, is a search and which is a search engine library written by yep. Doug Cutting from for. Uh, at, at the time, he was working for, at Xerox, and then he rewrote it when he was working for Apple, and then rewrote it again when he was working for Excite, and then. Yeah. There are quite a few libraries that use Lucene based indexes, so Yeah. It, it's I just belief, probably it's vector uh, operations. Yeah, uh basically that that's just like uh the algorithmic uh engine that uh, the that these search engines are using, which probably because it's Apache licensed, it's probably being more used in more than just uh open search. Yeah. Which uh Brody, I know that you went through like uh development courses in college. Did you use any mm -hmm. any tooling like open search? Um, I don't think we got into doing search stuff. We did do some, like, big data stuff with Hadoop and things like that, but a lot of the stuff I did with my, um, my course at the time was, like, very, it was either, it was either really outdated or very niche field where the professor, like, worked in that field and didn't want to touch anything else. Welcome to school. Yeah. Yeah. 
we had similar problems here uh, and I just checked and yes, uh, it's a, it's using ve vector operations and it's therefore dubbed as a vector database. Mm -hmm. So that's what Lucene does as one of its things, it's vector operations. Uh, I used another database, I can't remember the name of it from the top of my head, that, you, that used Lucene based indexes for a really fast in indexing and fast search across the database over loads of data. Fine enough, if you talk about Apache, uh, just today I started using the second Apache piece of technology. Mm. Besides Apache, the the web, web server, which I used in past because uh, Nginx appeared too scary for me. <laughs> but Nginx that, was too scary. Yeah, cool. it's it's uh its configuration is kind That's of That's actually it's, fair point. That's what yeah. I was scared about. Like well, the Apache only th has kind of nicer. Uh I've never actually worked with Apache myself. I've only ever worked with Engine X. Yeah. <laughs> Mostly cuz uh I looked at Apache and like that stuff looks old and crusty. Yeah. But it worked, so I used it. I mean, yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, there's a reason why I think uh, Apache is still like the number one web server used on the internet. Apache is uh, kind of the reason Linux Linux really became popular. If well, we're honest. Yeah. And then, of course, it, it turns out that it can only handle so many web requests at a time, yeah. which is why Nginx came out. Yeah. Uh, which I think... Nginx stood for something. I don't remember what it stood for. It's been a, it's been a hot uh. minute since, since I spoke to an Nginx guy. But uh, on the flip side, uh, let's talk about like uh, this wonderful video that mm -hmm. uh, hit my YouTube feed yesterday, posted by this guy by this guy in Australia named Brody. Never met him. Uh, <laughs> I, I I've never met him either. But. Uh, the title of it is that Ubuntu killed commercial desktop distros. Mm -hmm. And it was a trigger for like me because uh, I remember, uh, you know, uh, wa walking into stores and seeing like uh, these uh, CDs and floppy disks. I think I actually still have a Slackware floppy disk in storage. I didn't, t I didn't, I should have taken, taken the time to pull it out, pull it out. But I think I still have a Slackware 2.0's floppy set. Mm -hmm. It is, it's, it came in a box. Yeah, I had not a lot of big. comments like that. It was like, oh, I used uh, Yggdrasil. I used Red Hat Linux, not Red Hat Enterprise Linux, like original Red Hat Linux. I used, uh, I bought like Slackware, things like that. I bought SUS, so, like all of this stuff. And yeah, like uh, Ubuntu. Well, it's it's not just Ubuntu that did it. It was sort of like a multifaceted issue where Ubuntu came out. It was bankrolled by Mark Shuttleworth. It just did everything better because Mark Shuttleworth had infinite money. And also, they just gave out free CDs. So, well, like, how do you, at the time, how do you compete with that? Well, I don't know that he had the rocket launch money, so he had money. Yeah. yeah. He was rich before Canonical, like, long before yeah. Canonical. He, he had, like, a big investment. Or, or what was it? He sold some company and started some investment firm or something like that. And has, like, some, some like, um, hedge fund that he runs. All I know is he, he he went to space, so he did go to space. Yes, uh, uh, he founded he founded Thought Consulting, which is a company that uh, specialized in digital certifications and internet security. So which uh, he then lo sold money, which he then sold to Veris Verisign for three point five billion dollars. Yes, <laughs> yeah, uh, in <laughs> loads of money. Yeah, in nineteen ninety eight money. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, he th he then formed HBD Venture Capital, mm -hmm. uh, in parentheses here be dragons, <laughs> which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, it, which of course is venture ca capital firm, and we apparently see. that was relatively successful. Of uh, which he later sold to Knife Capital, which I don't see like a money thing on that. And then after uh... that, he proceeded to uh, form Canonical. Can yeah, you can yeah. you please now, repeat that name? Uh, who who he sold the VC company to? Uh, knife Capital. Knife. Or knight. Uh, knife. Okay, the blade. Yeah, knife. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, it's all on that because there is a fantastic story I would later on share with you if it was Knight Capital 
but it's not for podcast listeners. <laughs> yeah, it, that... it it is uh, misery incarnate for VCs for hedge funds. So good. Yeah, that and a uh, fun fact that I got from uh, talking with like some uh, really old school uh, can- uh, canonical developers. So we're mm-hmm. we're talking about like me talking with people that were like there to create Warty Warthog. Uh, nice. the, the literal litmus test for Ubuntu at the time was, does it boot on Mark Shuttleworth's ThinkPad? <laughs> Which is also a reason as to why ThinkPads have such great Linux support uh, from historical anecdotes. Because the li- that was a literal litmus <coughs> test. Does it, does it boot on, hi- on the boss man's ThinkPad? <laughs> uh, <laughs> but also yeah. were distros, like, there, there were obviously distros forming at the time. Like, Red Hat Linux had been around for a while. Debian and Slackware had been around for a while at that point. Um, yeah, Debian and Slackware were around forever. It's just Debian, that no, nobody Debian thought... Debian and Slackware started in like 93, 94, something like that. To actually make it good SOS. for the user experience. Yeah, th- uh, the big difference is that uh, Ubuntu was not really the first to actually do anything. Uh, they were the first one to do to have everything actually work. Uh, yeah. Because uh, it was not the first distro to ship with a with an active graphical environment on login nope. uh i think uh yggdrasil was actually the first one I, to do that i i don't know if it was the first they definitely made a big marketing point um but it was one of the very early ones uh yeah there might have been one before that but like people didn't know how to maintain distro it was the 90s no one knew how to maintain a distro yet yeah. like git didn't exist yet at all like people were just kind of like using whatever source control systems existed they kind of they're like they didn't know like how to maintain a distro like what the management structure should be how to really handle package repos so it was a lot of like things might have existed but they weren't really polished to the point of what like ubuntu ended up being yeah and uh, uh that that and ubuntu coming out was really just that big of a deal because uh uh it it turns out that when you ship a thing that actually works and you don't need to like figure out how to get you, how to configure your xorg.com file to not explode your monitor as soon as you hit the power button yeah that's the thing that happened uh that is a thing that happened and i and anyway. i am one of the people that had to do it <laughs> uh, a lot of people is... don't believe that but yeah especially with crts you can do a lot of damage with with especially early versions of xorg or X3D6, I guess, back then. Well, let's remember that since we're talking about age, there is a reason Canonical or can- or people around Canonical made Bazaar for version control. I don't know who, <laughs> who thought that that is a good idea, but yeah, I guess Git didn't really exist back then. Uh, I think... What? I think Git did exist by then. It's just that uh, the only Nobody one that was using Git it. was Linus. <laughs> yes. Yeah, around the... Well, Git existed because of the whole BitKeeper situation. That was what yeah. the kernel was using. When I don't remember what their Git original started. source control was. I think it was... They C- did use BitKeeper for a while. Uh, they used CVS, then they switched to BitKeeper, if I remember right. Right, 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 right. Uh, yeah. Okay. Initial release of GNU Bazaar was one month... Less than a month, like uh, 15 days, 14 days before Git came out. Yeah, all of, like there was a couple of things that came around at the same time, all trying to yeah. resolve the BitKeeper situation. Like Mercurial was around the Mercurial, same time. Mercurial, yeah. Well. Mercurial came out uh, 12 days after Git. Yeah, yeah. Like they all knew that something like BitKeeper was going to be the way you handle it. They realized that having these uh, centralized source code management yeah. systems just were not going paid to be ones. scalable anymore. Also um, paid ones. That also yeah, didn't help. that also didn't help. So but They, they knew they did something better for it. So everyone was trying to solve the problem yeah. at the same and time. Now, uh, in part, it's probably, Bazaar is probably the reason why Launchpad never succeeded. Let's forget the fact that it wasn't open source at the start because mm-hmm. that's it's that's entirely its own problem. Uh, that where... is a, that is entirely its own problem, and I don't want to go down that rabbit hole yet because uh, you know I was there for that discussion <laughs> where it literally showed that people actually don't care about that companies open source shit. They just want it open source, so it is open sourced. 
Not that actually yep. would actually do anything about it. Yep. Uh, thanks, Richard Solomon. But anyways, uh, so I was watching that video and it's like, man, I I I kind of want to just uh chat about like uh how I managed to uh get to get get to Linux because uh it's a wild story and I've told this to a few people and it and uh it has blown some people's minds. So, uh, for context, I live in a very rural area. And uh, at the time when I was a young little Josh and, uh, you know, I still had head, head of my hair. I haven't quite grown the beard yet. You still have uh, head on your hair. Yes. Good. Uh, well, anyways, uh, uh, I was tasked with getting a computer by my mom. <laughs> Because she's just like, I don't know what these computers do, but I hear that they're useful. So you should, so you should find a computer, and I will buy it for you, Josh. And I'm like, okay, this is fantastic. Well, I was twelve, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, here I am. I'm flipping through Sears catalogs that were like two years out of date. They they weren't quite selling computers out of Sears at this point. A uh, gateway did exist, and they could ship computers out to you. But I had no idea what I was looking at, and like. So I can get this thing, I can get this computer, and uh, we ordered it, and what we got was not a computer, we just got a monitor. <laughs> and uh, my yeah. mom was complaining to this uh, at like a, at the church, and uh, mm-hmm. this ha- this handy guy volunteered to uh, help, help us get a computer. Uh-huh. Well... Uh, this guy turns out to be a very special person later in life, but uh, he happens to be a free BSD developer, at least at the time he was. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he apparently knew a th- thing or two about computers. So he, <coughs> he uh, set us up with computers. And at the time, uh, he he tried getting a free BSD installed on it because, you know, that's just what you do. And uh, he couldn't get it working. <laughs> so he, ta- he takes the computer home with him. Mm-hmm. And uh, about four days later, he comes back with it using this uh, very brown operating system, of <laughs> which uh, I just knew it as computer. I didn't know what it was. Uh, all I know is that uh, I cl- I open it up. I have a way to edit edit my Word documents and then print them out because you know printer printer support was just merged at the time. So uh, we ha- I had a working printer. Uh, Wait, uh, and, did printers ever work? Let's clear that thing. Uh, this it. printer, this printer worked. Okay. I kind of doubt. I don't it. know what brand printer it was, but it did work. It was probably <laughs> HP, the only the only brand you can get you, you could get ever reliably working. Anything else just goes. Yeah, maybe not. Yeah. Even yeah. even HP does that every so often. Yeah, but uh, any anyways, uh, it worked. The scanner also worked, so I could scan documents onto the computer. Not that I ever did, and even the floppy drive worked. Holy! And uh, uh, although in order for in order for me to uh, actually you know mount the floppy disk because you know Fuse didn't exist yet. I had to double click this uh, icon that he placed on the desktop, which actually ran a bash script to mount the floppy disk. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And uh, this was my computer up until I graduated or uh, up until I got to college. And I, I learned what Microsoft Windows was when I, by the time I, m- I made it to college. Well, actually, my first day of college. <laughs> wow. Because, <laughs> you know, I had a computer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh we lived in the middle of nowhere i i and uh we, i didn't have internet until like 2009 mm-hmm. and uh i remember actually uh getting those ubuntu installation cds uh in the mail yeah the ship it ones yeah the ship it ones uh it was actually easier to get them in the box than the individual disc mm-hmm. like actually mm-hmm. easier so uh, the FreeBSD guy actually just got the box, and uh, he eventually rolled it rolled into a into doing a system integrator business, and he was doing like the whole uh, build a custom built computer and sell sell it running Linux thing uh, before you know like it actually got popular. Uh, 
Uh, he never made a whole lot of money off of it, but uh, that's what he did. And uh, nowadays, he's actually the IT administrator for my ASP, which is pretty cool. <laughs> but anyways, uh, I went... I rode the Ubuntu train just uh, migrating from the LTS release to the LTS release. It wasn't until like 2010 uh, that I actually got the prompt that I could up upgrade to a new version of Ubuntu. Mm -hmm. But And I've learned how to do a live system migration at the time too, which uh, <laughs> that was an interesting experiment because... Uh, I took the time, I printed out all the directions, and it's like, okay, so uh, here I am typing from my piece of paper. This is actually just a letter. Uh, typing this, 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 this. Uh, enter password. Uh, cross fingers, hope it doesn't break. It did break like three times, but I managed to do it. Uh, it, it turns out that uh, upgrading from Ubuntu 8.04 to 10.04 over a dial-up connection takes a very long time. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> how big was 10.04? Uh, it was only it was like seven hundred ish megabytes if I remember right. It was so on a it, dial up connection. It was rough. just small enough to fit on a CD. Mm. But I wanted okay. to see. Okay. But I even the, even though I could get the CD, uh, the CD came with this little slip that said that hey, did you know that you can upgrade your existing system to this too? And I'm like, I want to try that. <laughs> and so I did that. Uh. And, uh, you know, that was my introduction to, like, the command line on Linux, too. <laughs> because I, I didn't... now. 64-bit um, was 698. 32-bit was 699. Yeah. Uh, that said, I just got them from the FreeBSD guy, so I didn't actually know how much right. they cost. But uh... No, size, not... Oh, size? Yeah. Sounds about right. It it took like a week to download. Uh, so, uh, I wrote I rode through the LTS ch chain up until like uh, s the end of life of sixteen oh four because I just didn't want to upgrade to eighteen oh four because I didn't want to have to I didn't want to, I didn't want to go back to GNOME three because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know uh, at that time and I still think that sixteen oh four is probably still one of the best desktop releases. That a distro has ever shipped, because mm -hmm. uh, I still have a computer that runs sixteen oh four. It's a it's a completely air gap system, <laughs> because you know it's also a thirty two bit computer, and sixteen oh four still support uh, supported thirty two bit. But mm -hmm. I still have that, and every now and then I'll get into it. I've got that full Unity desktop with a w properly working uh, global desktop, which is not mm -hmm. even something that KDE nowadays can't can even admit to. And uh, it, it's just like uh, they did a very good job with that release, uh, just overall. And uh, I went from that, and that's when I. Uh, that's also when I, when I went, I went to college in fourteen oh four. That's when I learned I was actually using Linux and not Ubuntu. <laughs> and uh, that was also my introduction to Microsoft Windows. <laughs> You're like, hey, that Windows thing looks pretty cool. But, uh, you know, uh, I've been using this and it's been working for me. I had, I had to figure out how to ex how to export a document from a Le LibreOffice to a dot doc file, which is not something I had to do prior because by default it just uses ODF. <laughs> and then I had did to it not just have an, an export back then. Uh, it did, but it didn't do it by default. Ah, the, okay. in, it, uh, there, there was a, uh, you had to go in fi file and then export as, uh, export as docx rather than you know just save right, natively right. to docx or you you know you could just initially save the file as a docx but uh, I wasn't smart enough back then. But anyways, uh, I went through sixteen oh four and then, uh, it was after that then I switched to Debian stable. Uh, with uh, the XFCE desktop, because that that's just what you did when uh, you di you didn't want to touch a uh, gnome with a ten foot pole, and uh, that's what I wrote up right up until like the day I bought the fifty seven hundred XT. So like uh, all my lit all of my real like hackery stuff that uh, you see me doing with like Linux distros these days, that's all relatively within like the past five or six years. 
So it's it's relatively recent compared to a lot of people, but I've been using Linux for basically my entire lifetime. And uh, of course, uh, I do want to make one comment about that video. Mm -hmm. Ubuntu did not kill the commercial Linux desktop completely. Because mm -hmm. you could still pay $200 for Red Hat sure, like, on the desktop. What? Right, but that's not really targeting desktop users. That's t targeting. Are you sure? Biz that's targeting business users that have a desktop. It's not what I'm talking about. Uh, have you spoken with a Red Hat sales rep? Because that's not what they say. <laughs> I really doubt there are there are home users using it. I really doubt that. Uh, there's probably two. Yeah, I, I imagine <laughs> you're probably half of the users. I probably am. But you know, it, it is a thing. I'll have a link for. I'll have a link for for the viewer. For uh, our listeners in the show notes on how to buy Red Hat, uh, mm -hmm. it, it's right there. You can just click a button. They ask for your credit card. You give them two hundred bucks, and you have it. Why? Why do you? Why do you have that? Uh, because uh, for like uh, the plastics business, I used to have a stakeholdership in. Mm -hmm. uh, our business insurance said that we could use Linux on our computers. Mm -hmm. And like that's fine because I don't want I don't want to have to touch Windows if I don't have to because I don't know Windows I know Linux, and uh, they only had two approved Linux distributions. Mm -hmm. One was Ubuntu. The okay. other one was Red Hat. Sure. <laughs> and that was really the only two. Mm -hmm. No but, SUSE, nothing. Uh, SUSE was not an option, so uh, that's that's what I had to go with. Cause you know it's just like do I do I want to run do I want to run Ubuntu and like figure out like half the Ubuntu documentation doesn't work anymore because uh, everything is a snap now or do I just use Red Hat and uh, just see if I can make it work? Well, I made Red Hat work. <laughs> Which hey, uh, it worked. hey, it it worked and you know what? I don't feel bad about giving Red Hat money because <laughs> you know I I certainly feel better giving Red Hat money than you know like Microsoft because I know I know that Red Hat is actually spending the money in pretty good places, <laughs> and I'm just curious. Uh, like I know that uh you basically started from like Arch Linux on day one. Uh, has it only ever been Arch Linux? Have you never like actually considered like installing a different distribution? So I actually have used other things in the past. I've had like various little experiences here and there, like um. Most of my experience using Linux, like I was aware of Linux before university. Um, like I heard things about Proton when that was announced, the Steam machines when those were announced. But my first time actually properly trying it and like messing around with it was in university. Uh, one of my classes, we I think the class I was learning how to use Git. Yeah, they got us to install like a Ubuntu virtual machine to mess around with stuff. Because they didn't want to explain how setting up Git on Windows was done, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> and then easy. that that uh, course that I did, the, the like big data course I did, um, I think we were like using Hadoop and things like that. I think we did that in CentOS. So I've used both of those before Arch. And then uh sometime after that i switched over to arch entirely and i've I've considered using other things like i on like the laptops i have back on my shelf back there i'll probably put like fedora or something on them but i haven't really considered migrating away from arch on my main system at least right now if i did um I probably would just go to fedora or something like that and then any of the aur software i need i would do in like um, distro box because that is fine, I guess. Or you can, or you can use uh, Fedora's rendition of the AUR, which is Fedora Copper. Yeah, but there's a lot of things that don't exist in there. There's a lot of packages that don't build uh, properly because the Copper is more of like an open. It's less like the AUR where it's a package repo. It's more like a. It's a package repo plus it allows people to make use of Fedora's like build infrastructure. So yeah, there's yeah. a lot of duplicate packages and stuff like that so yeah it's not, it, it's not exactly it's essentially ppas it's it's ppas yeah, but done yeah. in a much cleaner fashion <laughs> sure yeah but uh 
I, I know that, like, uh, my time with Arch Linux, like, half the things I would install would have to come from, like, the AUR, which is why I've never really felt particularly comfortable, like, using Arch Linux. Never mind the fact that the, I run into, like, the weirdest issues whenever I run, run Arch Linux. It's, like, mm-hmm. we're up to the point where, like, the Pac-Man developers don't even know what the fuck is going on. Mm-hmm. So, uh... I think I've maybe got, like, five packages installed from the AUR. Like, it's not... Maybe it was when you tried it, but nowadays there's a the, most things you want to in there. Unless you're going out of your way, and this is the main reason I had installed a lot of stuff from the AUR in the past. If you're going out of your way to find like little niche pieces of software, yeah, or like you have weird hardware that drivers don't exist in the repos for sure, especially like a lot of older printers, um, or you for whatever reason need deprecated software. But in a lot of other cases, I just don't. Like, I like having the AUR there as an option in the cases where I need it, but most of the time, I, I, I don't. Yeah, in the meantime, uh, Big Pod here has, like, the most reasonable journey for, like, distros. Uh, I know that uh, he's he's currently on this immutable hype train, but I know he definitely worked on something prior. Uh, yeah. What about you, Big Pod? <laughs> so, I started on Ubuntu, so playing around with Linux when I was, like, 13, 14. Just checking. And... I only checked out the server version, so I was, like, super lost. But in, I would say, like, when I was 15, 16, in one of the computer classes or really labs for practical classes, professor had only CentOS installed, and that was really my first big experience. But as I was already used to using Linux, I was the only one who hit the ground running. It was GNOME 2 at the time, so because CentOS, even if it was the latest version of CentOS, it was still GNOME 2 because it was probably five years so out of date compared to other distros when it comes to desktop. And at that point, then I went back on Ubuntu. First time I ran my own laptop with Linux. It was 1710 and 1804. At which point the laptop broke, so I didn't have Linux distro for a while. So I played around in virtual machines, came across Arch, used that for a while, and then went back to Ubuntu, plus did some other stuff in just testing, uh, started working on Ubuntu Mate, helping Martin, then I went for a quick stint to NixOS, learned that that thing is stupidly insane and nobody should use it. And then, because I like the concept, went to a much more saner distro called Fedora Silverblue, and that, w- w- at which point I found the Ublue project, and that's where I am till this day. Mm-hmm. So that oh, but wait a February second. Last year. Wait a second. Mm-hmm. Didn't you didn't you have something to do with Mate as well? Through Ubuntu Mate uh, engagement, yeah, they also like I remember seeing I remember seeing Mate. you on some contributor notes from it. <laughs> Probably, <laughs> you know, Probably. just a time or two. Uh, of course, appropriately matched by plenty of emojis because you know that's just what the Ubuntu Mate does in the release yeah. notes. All the emojis that they that they could possibly put in there. Uh, I. I wish that, uh, you know, they, they would keep doing that into the future, even though uh, Mate is not, like, the world's quickest moving project. <laughs> yeah. But, and it uh, is moving at exactly the pace that wasn't to my liking. Yeah, and uh, a very common thing across, like, all these distributions uh, that the three of us have, uh, you know, uh, have come to uh, realize, and I know that uh, we have all learned to uh, love and interact with at some point in our lives. Mm-hmm. Uh, has been Xorg X11, <laughs> which uh, yeah. has a long and storied history, has a lot of really cool features, but it's also uh, it's also got like an end of life date. Good. X11, it's time. literally 1984. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. It literally, no, it actually started in 1984. I, I, I'll make this joke every chance I get. Oh, We're talking it? about a piece of software oh, that still has support for printer as a display. Yeah, X11. Okay, so X11 is a weird thing where 
it was made at a time before the idea of personal computers were like a widespread thing. Like yeah. they did exist in a very small capacity, but nothing like they, they do now. And X11 is basically the most generic way to, I guess, handle outputs. I'm not going to say display because you can like, yeah, that was, that was a legitimate use case for X11 using for, a printer as a display for a younger audiences yes i'm not we're not joking here yeah this, printers used to be displays because well you need somehow to explain monitors weren't a thing yet so what they did was they printed out information onto a printer that's why it's, i'd say yeah, it's but, a display but uh, not really but yeah and josh has still still receives on such a thing uh, weather information, am I right? Uh, well, it, it, it's a little bit more modern. What I do, what I do now is I just use like a shell script that uh, d that uh, that grabs the output from like wttr.in and then just sends it off to my printer because uh, I just don't want to turn a screen on in in my mornings. You know that that's just what I do. <laughs> so you waste uh, paper. Yeah, I just waste paper because you know paper's cheap. <clears throat> a unless you're buying dot. Uh, the, the paper's fine, but the ink's the, the bigger problem. Well, it's yeah. a laser printer. It's fine. Ah, oh, that's fair. <laughs> uh, that was that script actually uh, came as a result of me trying to keep an inkjet printer alive because this was before like auto scrubbing was a thing in ink, an inkjet printer, so you actually just had to use it if you never wanted the ink to dry out. Uh, that's where the idea of that script actually came out with initially was for like maintenance on on a printer. Uh, that was back when it used to run every six hours rather than once a day. Uh, but uh, I've discovered I've discovered the light of uh, the laser printer, and now I now the fact that I only have to buy like a forty dollar four dollar cartridge of toner like once a year is perfectly fine. Another feature that is I don't I don't understand why exists today, but it had a purpose before is uh, direct built-in support for remote desktop. Well, that actually. It makes perfect sense why that existed then, because yes. you often weren't running applications and your X server well, at the same time. Like early X server, no, like it's not just that. We should remember that back in the day, a computer was the size of this room, if not sure. bigger. It was a well, mainframe, would, and all they had to do was pull it? cables to the to the stations. Put mm -hmm. like, uh, I think Josh has one of those things. With uh, used to. I actually, I actually did sell. I, I actually did sell, sell it to a museum. <laughs> a little but, terminal, and mm -hmm. then just plug the terminal in, and everything happened on the mainframe. So that's why remote well, was needed. Mm -hmm. uh, there was that, and I believe that uh, this actually came out of MIT, where th yes. where they had a dedicated uh, server building at the time where they p w would post all their servers at and uh that the idea that that came into uh the the i think it was uh x386 at the time that came out that introduced this feature but uh they patched that in, uh there was a group there that patched that into uh x386 because they wanted to be able to to have just the one building that have all the servers that would feed all the terminals across the entire campus. Mm. And it's a pretty... I still think that that is a very neat idea. Like, yeah. uh, to this day, I still dream of have of, you know, if I ever get, like, a family, I, I still dream of that one central computer that just everybody used. Because, you know, then uh, there's only one piece of, of hardware that I ever have to troubleshoot. and well, But, you know, I've got, like, different different users logged in on different displays displays and configurations across the this place which is pretty cool even to this day that idea still lives on using something called vdi virtual display infrastructure virtual desktop infrastructure mm -hmm. basically and it's even smarter because you're using vms mm -hmm. for each one to have a virtual environment to live in and the reason well, it's smarter is because security, and which is why the tool that will replace X11 is built with security in mind. Well, 
the security mine part of Wayland is some of its security in mind. Some of it is the developers legitimately just not considering use cases that users have. And I don't, I don't just mean like a specific desktop. I mean like the project itself. If you go look at just my, my favorite example of this is the idea of optional screen tearing. That was a multiple year discussion to convince people that you actually want to have screen tearing as an option because the people who were designing it were not gamers. They just didn't, they didn't play games because they're designing Wayland protocols all day. So they didn't understand the actual value of having that for the potential increased, um, I guess, not it, reaction it, it was time, just like uh, a rendered frame, frame, yeah, yeah, rendered frame, frame, frame rate. All yeah, that yeah. bullshit. Which, uh, you gotta remember that, like, uh, if you're playing a video game, you wanna get those frames as generally as quickly as you want, because uh, when when you get that, you, first of all, it's a much smoother experience when you're actually playing the game, especially, like, these faster-paced ones, like uh, FPS games, racing games, and all that, where, you know, uh, it doesn't matter how the image looks at the end of the day, as long as you get the picture, that way you get context as to what's going on in the game. There was a very uh, long time where people played Counter Strike in four by three because it just meant there was uh, <laughs> there was less to worry about. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it took it, you you got higher frame rate, and uh, it it has been statistically proven that yes, in fact, high frame rate makes you better gamer. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I doesn't help me it, much though. It's actually been scientifically proven, Big Pod. Sorry, <laughs> I still highly doubt it for majority of people because at the end of the day, most people don't actually have that kind of uh, all together. Whether it be monitors, whether it be general general awareness of what is happening. To the level like someone a professional would have. Well, the effect is going to be larger on people who... There, there is definitely a point of diminishing returns where most people aren't going to notice it. Like, if you've used a 120Hz display, anything above that is pretty much imperceptible unless you are someone who is, like, 18 years old playing 12 hours of Counter-Strike a day. A but there yeah. is definitely used... a big difference between 30 and 120. And anyone yeah. who thinks there's not a difference there is, yeah. I think they need to get the eyes checked. Uh, there is but a noticeable someone, difference between 30 and 60. <laughs> but as someone who has seen 360 hertz displays and still uses 60 hertz displays, there really ain't like enough of a difference for me to even consider buying them. 360, I agree. Like I, I've seen 360 displays, and I I can't really tell the difference about 120. Let's um, rem let's remember. But there was remember, definitely a jump for me with 60. I used everything in between, and even 120. Just it just there isn't enough of a benefit for me to buy for what I do, which is mostly stare at code. And when I do play games, it's mostly things don't move very much. Well, this is something that the mobile market realized as well that. High resolution matters a lot less, but even just for regular desktop movement around, like scrolling through browsers, things like that, there is still value in a higher refresh rate. Now, not not three sixty. That's that's understandable. Look. But you can definitely f feel a responsiveness difference between a sixty hertz phone and sure. a one twenty hertz, and the same sure. is true on the desktop as well. Yeah, uh, my, honestly, my solution. My enough. solution when. Yeah, my solution for the phones is I just turn off animations. <laughs> yeah, well, if you're scrolling through a browser, right? Like, it having yeah. the, the text move slightly smoother. There is definitely something that feels nicer about that. Yeah, uh, my phone has adjustable 6120. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I used it for two days. And then I went down to 60 just to see if I noticed the difference. Mm -hmm. I noticed it for half an hour. That there was something yeah, you get used weird. To it for sure. And then when I mean, they, uh, oh, better battery, I, I don't care. Yeah, no, that's what that's what I did. I just I turned off animations and then I and then I lowered the frame rate to sixty because uh, heaven forbid, uh, most of what I do doing, doing on my phone is just watching YouTube videos. So it's not like I'm actually reading text or scrolling right. through it or uh, I'm not really playing games on the phone. Uh, yes, I do. I read. I I guess I do read like uh, ma mangas on the phone because you know I'm a weeb, but. Uh, you know, uh, 
that's about what I use my phone for. But yeah. anyways, uh, I wanted to uh, get get into a bit of a discussion with you guys because, you know, uh, Brody has a lot of videos on Wayland, but uh, he doesn't really cover, like, uh, uh, the tooling behind Wayland. Sometimes you do. Mm -hmm. uh, like, you'll talk about compositors or, like, some neat little cool. tools every now and then. But uh, I want to talk about, like, the from the context of, of like, the person that has yet to actually install install or you know just log into a Wayland session or if they have they have it for a very long time mm -hmm. so i went out and i collected a couple of resources here uh the most common website that uh used to exist i it doesn't look like it's been updated for a while is simply a website called are we wayland yet mm -hmm. uh which uh they their take the uh I'm talking about like uh, from the perspective of, like the window manager user. So like somebody like DistroTube, uh, he he would probably find like this discussion particularly important. Mm -hmm. So uh, we got application launchers. First of all, uh, I'm sorry, D menu users. Uh, there is there are ways to get D menu working in Wayland, but D menu itself does not properly support Wayland. So uh, yeah, I switched from D menu over to Toffee. Toffee is not on the. This is really out of date. Yeah, Toffee's been around for a while now. Um, D menu works, but because so there's um I'm blanking on the protocol name, but there is a protocol for I think it I think it's just XDG shell actually uh, that a lot of that launchers will use to make sure they you know stay above Windows and things like that. Um, X D menu is going to run through X Wayland, so it's not going to use the protocol. Also, it's just not designed for Wayland anyway. Uh, so I've had issues where it like appears on the wrong screen or appears behind windows or other like doesn't grab my keyboard things like that. But there is there are so many replacements for it. Like you you don't need you, you don't need D menu right. Like there there are so many clones of D menu at this point that I'm sure you can find something that makes you happy. Yeah, like uh, the most uh, clone of clones that I've seen for D menu has been like uh, the uh, conveniently named B menu, which mm -hmm. is B E menu rather than D menu. Uh, which yeah, I've used that uh, one before as well. Uh, it looks just like a uh, bone stock D menu. I don't. I haven't actually used it a whole lot myself. But I know you can script with it just like you could with D menu. I don't know if uh, it supports many of the same same patches that the D menu supports. Uh, uh no. Yeah, it, it's it's kind of just bare bones. Which I'll be honest with you, for an application launcher, I don't do that fancy of stuff anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but of course, uh, because I I also noticed that that page is also relatively out of date. Uh, I did find uh that there was one of those awesome software lists uh that that's just like posting a GitHub repo, so I've got that linked as well. Which uh this one's a little bit more up to date. Uh, it's actually a fork of an of another one of, one of these posts. Uh, that is actually maintained as of two days ago from the looks of it. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, it it is far more in depth. And it and it does come come into a bunch of bunch of uh, discussions, but uh, uh, let's scroll through here. So, like on on uh, for laptops specifically, mm -hmm. uh, I know that uh, people have have all, always used like a X eleven commands to uh, adjust the screen brightness. Well, of course, Wayland doesn't necessarily have like that backend server that's running uh that that's going to be handled by like either your, either the compositor that you're using which is basically like the window manager or uh in the case of like wl roots a separate third-party tool anyway uh which there are several of them uh i know that uh there, there's two specifically, like Brightness CTL and Brillo, that uh, just modify like the Sys class backlight f file directly, which uh, mm -hmm. not necessarily something you want to do because uh, that mm -hmm. requires root privileges. But uh, there, there are stuff like uh, what, what's it called, Luminance, which is a GTK application that uh, pro goes through uh, DDI CI uh, pipelines, which is probably a bit closer to what you want to do. Uh, there's also a program that I've seen in the past called Light as well. Uh, I don't know. I it's not on this list, but I've seen it around, and I know that's still packaged in like uh, repositories. But of mm -hmm. course, I know that the three of us don't, aren't really necessarily like using these uh, bare bones Wayland compositors on on laptops. So, and uh, but uh, we could uh, we could take a minute to talk about uh, compositors because you know uh, I love compositors. Uh, Brody, you've messed around with compositors. In fact, uh, you you've talked you've talked 
spoken with uh, some very fairly pro- prominent uh, compositor users in the past. And Big Pod, uh, I know that you're I know that you're on the desktop environment train, but maybe maybe one of these compositors could actually introduce you. So, right now, I am as well. I've been using KDE for the past couple of months. Well, so. yeah, I know you have, and I've been using KDE for the past couple of months too, because you know, I I was just I've I'm just uh curious about, it, so I'm using it. But uh, the compositor that uh, you've seen on like a lot of my content that I've that I tr- that I've basically just been using has been Sway, because you know uh, when it comes down to uh, it just works, that's what Sway is, mm-hmm. uh, which it is it is a tight. Ty- it is a tiler, so uh, like uh, you get you get like the pseudo dynamic tiling, not necessarily like manual tiling. Uh, that that's cage rake. That's a whole different ball game. But uh, you know, uh, big pod. I well, know sway is uh, manual tiling. It's it's the, the terminology is weird, right? Manual tiling in the context of a tiler generally means you select the direction things are going to split. Um, it which depends is on it depends on your definition of manual. Because well, there are some there tilers are... where you specify if you mm. even want to spawn a second window before you actually spawn the window. Okay. That's how manual it gets. <laughs> well, that's my definition of a manual tiler. That's that's like your uh, that's like the default Herb's left WM configuration. That's also how sure. cage break works. Right, 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 uh, right. So if you want to get manual, we can get really manual, which is why I call Sway pseudo manual because uh, you do spawn windows w- mm-hmm. uh, if you just you know repeatedly repeatedly open up your terminal and then you have to hit another button to go in a different direction. So mm-hmm. yes, it is manual in that sense where you pick the direction that your windows are open in. But uh, Big Pod, I know that you love your web development, right? What if yep. I told you that there is a Wayland compositor that you can run entirely out of a web browser. I mm-hmm. know that is one. Just can't remember the name. It's called Greenfield. Yeah, I, I <laughs> meaning to reach out. I reached out to the developer that are ages back, and I didn't end up getting on the podcast. Um, Great. But that is that is a really odd project. <laughs> it is. It's like, man, I I I also just want to mess around with it one of these days because it just looks cool. <laughs> Which I, I, I don't know if it's good. That's the thing. I have no idea if it's good. It's been around. It there's talk, a talk of Fostum from 2019, so it's been in development for quite a while now. Um, at least from what I'm seeing here, it looks like oh, it's still getting a bit of updates, but it has slowed down quite a bit. Yeah, it it has slowed down quite a bit. But you know, after a certain point, when you're like uh, going through like these Wayland compositors, and you find like a good good point where it's just like, yeah, uh, I'm kind of just uh. I'm kind of just done, done adding features to this. Uh, let's yeah, just I'm not uh, sure write, like write how developed it is, so I can't really comment on that. Yeah, I I don't know either, but uh, you know, I'm just going from like my from like my viewership on like uh, the Wayland mm-hmm. compositors because you know uh, quite a few of them kind of just like hit a point where it's just like yeah, we're kind of just done done adding things to this. Like uh, yeah, what is Cage going to add now that you know it it launches into a proper kiosk? What features do they want? Probably <clears> none <throat> because it's a kiosk. Well, it's just a matter of making sure things are consistently working, but that's that's a lot less development effort than you know the the core adding new features. Yeah, and then uh, of course uh, the big one that a lot of people uh, know, especially like if they're running the Steam Deck, uh, Bazai, or like Steam OS or Holo ISO, uh, that's Game Scope, and uh, this is the one that this is the the Black Magic compositor that Valve creates because I don't know how how uh, they do it. But sometimes, like if you run your game through a game scope, it just fixes so many things, and I have no <laughs> idea how it does it. And I'm waiting for the day where it's like somebody just forks it and makes it into like a proper environment, because <laughs> mm-hmm. it's gonna happen eventually. <laughs> <laughs> game scope, well, from my understanding, well, game scope is very like specific use case thing. It's got a lot of, it's got a lot of additional features to it. You just don't really see in anything else. Like, you don't really see, like, window scaling at, like, an individual... Like, a scaling just a single window, having, like, FSR built in at that level. Like, just you don't really need these in anything else. Um, I don't know how it manages to make things work, but the additional features are definitely, um, are definitely nice to have. And I guess, you know, it's, it's a Valve project, so 
they're specifically like the main focus there is games so if there are issues there those are the things that are going to be focused on trying to fix right like yeah it's not the same thing with something like sway where it's a generic desktop that games are a part of that but it's not everything yeah it, but you know it, it, it is a fantastic project to at least watch and uh you know uh i i'm i've been uh, i have been messing around with with it a little bit for like some applications as well like not non-game applications uh, even though mm-hmm. it treats everything like the video game because that's what it's for but you know it's, it happens to be on the system so it's like hey let's la- let's launch launch firefox in, in a game scope window because you know uh that supports like uh, uh i believe game scope actually does have packaged hdr support in in newer builds mm-hmm. so uh that that's how you can get like a HDR working on Sway, which Sway doesn't support HDR and pro- potentially never will, because why would they? But uh, you know, uh, uh, we have to talk about Hyperland because you know, uh, it it is uh the it is rice out of the box to the point where I think that you could just take a stock Im- stock stock screenshot of Hyperland, post it on Unix porn, and not get the post removed. <laughs> <laughs> Well, at the end of the day, we're forgetting the most important Wayland compositor ever, Weston. Well, of course, we gotta talk about Weston because a uh, Weston is Wayland. Yeah. Uh, like it is as official of a compositor as you can get because it is developed by the Wayland team. It's a reference implementation of a compositor. Yeah, w- Weston is well. Weston actually does have some usage in the. Um, IoT space, especially for like car heads-up displays, uh, a lot of a lot of those that are powered by Wayland are powered by Weston. Um, but you don't really see Weston on the desktop, and it's never really been that's never really been like the main focus of Weston anyway. Uh, uh, can I tell you that probably more people can use Weston than any other Wayland compositor? What do you mean? Have you ever heard of this te- this technology or this operating called Windows? Sure. Do you know that Windows has Linux subsystem? Oh, sure. Yeah, with WSL. Yeah, Western is the um. Uh, WSL. Is that, G- do they actually use Western for the compositor in WSL? Uh, for, for they have a, uh, they have a thing called WSLG, which is basically graphical add-on for yeah, yeah, yeah. WSL, and it uses uh, Western and a couple of other things to compile it. Uh, an application for you to see as a singular application on your on your desktop. Yeah, I, I knew it had... Um, I've seen the architecture diagram, but I didn't actually know it was using Western, uh, Western to actually make yeah. that work. See, I, I don't always... know how, how, how much is the, like, the GUI stuff in WSL actually used, though, because most of the WSL stuff that I hear about is, you know... Using you know some Linux development U- tool using the command line, to... yeah, 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 yeah. Well, but I know I used it in the past. Yeah, it it it's seen enough use for them to justify developing it. I can tell yeah. you, sure, yeah. I can tell you that much because you know uh, I I much enjoy the fact that now you can install Rhythmbox, which is an obje- objectively still a very good music player on Windows, <laughs> and and it's a lot better than some of the the applications you use on Windows nowadays. Uh, I have looked at that. Win- I have looked at that Windows 11 uh, music player, uh, the default one, and that thing mm-hmm. looks like hot garbage. <laughs> I wouldn't know. I, I, I listen to mu- to music through a streaming service. I, I'm sorry, I'm old fashioned. I still have downloaded files and ripped CDs. Yeah, I. Yeah, no, that is that is horrendous. <laughs> that is that is really <laughs> bad. It kind of uh, looks YouTube like music. discount Spotify, but worse. Probably. Yeah, I would, uh, on on Windows, I just used Foobar. <laughs> I mean, uh, Fu- Foobar is Foobar is a good music player if you want just a music player. Mm. Which you know, uh, in my world, that's perfectly fine too. Like if if you want like an alternative for Foobar uh, on Linux, you can look at the uh, what's that? I I can't remember the name of it now. Um. Uh, it's the one that DT did a video on, like figuring like forever ago. Dead beef. Or yes, stations. dead beef. Uh, dead beef. Yes. Dead beef. Yeah, uh, which uh, that's. It's not quite foobar. 
Mm-hmm. But it, but you could scale it up to be a pretty good foobar alternative. Wait, mm-hmm. isn't yes. Windows 11 music player just their video player? Yeah, probably. Yes, because I just opened uh, an episode of NTA and it opened what I think is also their video player. Yeah, it's probably the same window. <laughs> But of course, uh, if if you're wanting to mess around with yes, like the world of WO, yeah, I I confirm it is because I also opened a a video of NTA and it instead of play and it switched to play to play video. Okay, so uh, I know Smart. that uh, uh, we've also got like the desktop environments that are moving on towards like uh, building up Wayland support. Uh, have you, have, uh, you looked at Magpie at all yet, Brody? Magpie. Yeah, that's the, that's the one for Budgie. Oh, is that what it's called? Uh, yep. Yeah, I've, I've seen Budgie stuff. I didn't know what their, their thing was called, though. They're gonna have their own compilator. Huh. Yes. Well, yeah. It, it's a, they want to, they want to uh, start moving more stuff off of, uh, off of Mutter. Which off I don't blame him for, because, you know, uh... It's really hard to like work as a downstream fork of a gnome project. <laughs> it is still a fork of Mutter, but it's it and it's a soft fork, but I wouldn't be surprised if it hard forked at some point. Yeah, eventually it's just going to diverge. Mm-hmm. Uh that that's just a fact of life. And you know what? I just I'm just waiting for the day that that actually happens because that's that's effectively what cinnamon is at this point. Mm. Uh which I know that they are. Now, uh, this list also has a bunch of dead ones as well. Like, I don't think, uh, I don't think, uh, Foxwell is really relatively well developed. Uh, I know Hikari is, but Hikari is mostly found in, like, the BSD land. Yes. Uh, J is not necessarily developed so much anymore. But, of course, if, you know, you're a fan of the Rust language, J is probably the best, best of them. Uh, I'm kind of curious to see what comes out of the uh, the stuff with Smithy more recently now. Now that Cosmic's uh, Cosmic is going to be getting its Alpha two very soon, so um, I, I'm kind of curious to see as as that sort of Rust stack improves if we're going to start seeing more actually appear in that space. I think that the the, the work that they've done on Smithy it uh, could be almost at could have like the same effect that like wl roots has had because uh there is a huge movement behind rust and people <laughs> want to develop like these rust applications if you might not have noticed the meme of rewrite everything in rust mm-hmm. uh where you know we've we've got like projects that are completely rewriting like the GNU, the uh, GNU core utils in rust uh there's operating systems r- wrote completely in rust there's more than one there's more than just redox mm-hmm. uh and uh i know that uh, people have tried to like implementing uh plugin systems to translate uh uh rust apis for like some of these window managers as well uh which uh i know that the hyperland project for that one is kind of dead thank goodness <laughs> but uh i i'm i'm excited to see what comes out of that because it's not like i'm a big fan of rust like i look at rust code i have no idea what i'm looking at because uh there, there are so many like external library calls that you make it make in rust that i can't like wrap my li- little wee brain around it because you know mm-hmm. i spent so many years looking at like the c and lua code that I, that I, that i've been messing around with where you know uh i know generally what every single line in in a, a dwm dot c file does but i don't necessarily know like what the heck is going on and like uh anything in rust well i can read rust fairly badly but honestly while i would rather write rust than c i don't think rust deserves all the hype it gets it, it probably doesn't but at the same time you know it's popular so if, favorite... if it's if it's popular i think it's fine <laughs> My favorite recent thing with Rust is it is a great litmus test for people who are just making shit up on the internet. Yes. So, this, my here's my logic, right? So, the Rust developers and the Rust project constantly talk about memory safety and how, like, important memory safety is and all this. Now, memory safety, for anyone who is not a big developer, you might think, oh, Rust is the memory safe language. Now, 
the Venn diagram of programming languages and memory safety is basically a circle, with the exception of C, a lot of C++, basically the C part of C++, and assembly. Basically everything else is memory safety yes. that people are using now. No, but I have here's to... here's the thing. Correct no, no you. here's the thing. Let me, let me just finish this point. So, because they talk about it so much, you'll see people who are like, shit talking about Rust and talking about how memory safety isn't important. When I see this, I'm like, okay, you are not actually a programmer. You have no idea, like, you don't even realize that most languages are memory yes. safe. You you think, because you hate Rust so much, you think that this is, like, the thing to focus on. Like, the, the, Rust does a lot of other cool things, like yeah. the uh, the borrow checker and all this stuff. Like, that's the actual interesting stuff. But I hate it, the dude. memory safety, because they talk about it so much, it's just, it, it triggers so many people that it gets you to... Very quickly, say who's just making shit up. I had there somebody make this an memory safety note argument I have with to me. Make on the memory safety before we continue, mm -hmm. the reason why memory safety is so much talked about is because it's the only low-level language that really is memory safe, and the reason yeah, for that that's is where it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Only was every other implementation of memory safety, whether it be Go, whether it be F sharp, C sharp, Java. Anything else, JavaScript, mm. or any, any language you want that has memory safety of some sort. We're talking about Ari has some sort of garbage collector, some sort of virtual environment is running in our mm. sort of runtime, or both, which is in most cases. And Rust gets rid of all that and does it on the, at the compile time, which is mm. why, first of all, it takes so long. Second of all, it can be as low level as it is and not waste as much performance as something like Go, Java, or C Sharp. Mm -hmm. Go and C I Sharp. I feel like people are talking about the compile time, though. Like, that's, that's another thing that people bring up often. It's like, yeah, but you haven't ever compiled a program. Every program you install is from your package manager. Why does it bother you how long it takes to compile? Uh, I, I never understood the whole compile time debate. Why would people care? Because... If you're actually caring about compile time, which means you're compiling programs on and on and on, you're probably smart enough to have a build server. Mm -hmm. Or not a one build server, but an entire build farm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or, or you know, you're smart enough to pay GitHub to do that for you. Because <laughs> <There you go. laughs> have uh, I've looked at those GitLab prices and I can't justify it. <laughs> well, you can do it for free. Just host well, it yourself. I, I know you can. I, I, I've got I know in, a guy. I got in that room back there behind me. <laughs> I know a guy who does it. Basically, every time he sets up a server or new yep. servers. Uh, which uh, you know, I. That was of course, we're gonna, if we're if we're gonna be talking about compile times, uh, I I need to make the uh uh disclaimer that yes, I am that guy that has used Gen two for like two uh the last uh, two years. I've been on and off of it. Uh. Of course, people accuse me as be of being a distro hopper, but, but you know, <laughs> am I really a distro hopper if I'm just reinstalling the same operating system? <laughs> yeah, uh, and before we, for like a lot of part of the the time it's spent on building things on C, it's spent on linters and mm -hmm. bullshit like that and checkers and basically same same things. Uh, Rust kernel implements out of the box <laughs> just at a much better level. Yeah, which uh, I, I know that compiling GCC, the, the actual compilation of GCC actually is relatively quick. It's all the checks you run after the compiler mm -hmm. to make sure your compiler actually works. <laughs> that that takes forever. <laughs> yep. Now, uh, of course, uh, let's, let's get back to the topic here with like uh, Wayland as well. Uh, the what we talked about were like the popular uh, compositors that you see people like, go out and use, like the Tiling Window Managers. Uh, of mm -hmm. course, if you need like a desktop environment uh, example, uh, GNOME probably still has like the most polished Wayland integration, with with Plasma having the most feature rich. Uh, that's KDE yeah. Plasma and GNOME itself. Now, uh, whether or not KDE's works, that's dependent on the version of KDE that you're using. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, depends on how much the package maintainer of uh, KDE actually cares about Wayland. Because some of them just don't. But, you know, if you're using Fedora, for example, KDE works perfectly fine on Wayland. <laughs> yep. Where if you're on uh, like uh, other operating systems like uh, Void Linux, uh, you can you can enable the Wayland session KDE, but uh, you're missing a lot of those environment variable calls that you that you need for it to run properly. Well, if you're in Void, you have a lot of other problems. <laughs> well, yeah, but you know, uh, Void Gang does exist. I've mm. gotten emails from them. <laughs> well, isn't it that uh, next release of Fedora won't have uh, X11 at all in any of their, shall we say, primary versions like GNOME. Well, uh, ju just to let you know, sir, I don't have an X11 session on my Fedora system now. Of course, yes. <laughs> but there is still packages that are kind of supported by some. And with 41, so the I believe... Way it's gonna uh, the way it's going to be, gone. I believe, is um, they're not going to be removed. It's just going to be... It's going to be in the repos, but you have to install it after, ins yeah. uh, after install. And not supported. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's not going to be supported. Like, if you choose to install it, you're kind of, like, on your own. Um, there were the plans to originally get, like, ditch it entirely, but there was... There was still some stuff holding back. Like, even the... Um, even the like GNOME, I know I don't know if the KDE developers commented on it, but the GNOME developers definitely did. Being like, there are still reasons why we haven't gotten rid of it upstream. You getting rid of it now is not gonna speed anything up. <laughs> yeah, uh, we'll see about that. But uh, I I do I know, think like, it will speed things up. But uh, the, there the are big, reasons to keep it. Uh, the the biggest reason uh, why you would still use X11 is almost purely accessibility at this point. Yeah, uh, like, uh, accessibility and there's some um, there's some art stuff that's still a bit flaky on on Wayland. Like a lot of tablet configuration stuff doesn't. There's there's some stuff missing from the tooling that's available. Interesting, um, because if I'm honest, I never I never had with X any kind of good experience with my laptop touch screen. No drawing ta drawing tablet specifically. I don't technically know. About technically, those are in many ways same as a start screen. Yeah, but it, it is the same technology. But it's but uh, some some drawing tablets are not treated as like screens at all. Yeah, it isn't just that. Like, but uh, but in all honesty, with XORG, this thing was basically useless when it came to a touch screen. Yeah. Uh. Well. Uh, so we do have the desktop environment options, uh, mm. and so, uh, if you upgrade the Wayland and you're already a KDE user, just on your login screen, uh, just select the Wayland session and just go for it, you know, just mm. give it a try. Uh, same for Gnome. Or, yeah, same thing with, the, well, Gnome actually does it by default, so, uh, you yep. already know that, uh, <laughs> you already know that it exists. Uh, and now. the amazing part is everything works, like, my laptop, which is Linux only, runs only Wayland because I don't want to have problems when I touch my screen because mm -hmm. it has a touch screen and it's used all the time, like right now. Yeah, the first thing that I do whenever I'm using GNOME with the touch screen is I disable Cairo. <laughs> I haven't disabled anything. Yeah, uh, I, I still disable it anyway because I don't ever want to touch touch that on-screen keyboard. I, I have a keyboard on the laptop. What do I need an on-screen keyboard for? Oh. It's not even a 2 on one Oh, the whole, uh, yeah, the on-screen keyboard is kind of crap. Yeah, that that's what Cairo is. You now, really uh, the on-screen keyboard. Come on, yeah. come on, people. It got <laughs> better, but it's still trash. Yeah, but anyways, uh, let's just say that uh, you you you're a different kind of animal, right? Like, uh, you you've seen like these Wayland compositors. Hyperland is too fancy for you. Sway is just not for you. Uh, you let let's just say that like you're the open box user. Uh, you mm -hmm. you're very opinionated on open box. What it, what option do you have on Wayland? Well, uh, the, you have two options. Well, one of them is called Waybox, which is quite literally advertised as open box for Wayland. Mm -hmm. Uh, it is also a dead project, just like open box. But uh, another one that I do recommend that a lot of people people would uh with that kind of opinion would look at 
Lab WC, mm-hmm. uh, which uh, Lab WC goes as far as having a very familiar looking configuration file to open box. It's still that XML file. Uh, they're working on GUI applications uh, for Lab for Lab WC, just like uh, Open Box had, of which uh, that that's actually of which even like desktop environments like LXQT is actually mm-hmm. now has now officially adopted Lab WC as like their primary compositor for the for the Wayland session. Which I think is cool because uh, L- LXQT uh, already did uh, all the LXQT applications uh, did in fact work on Wayland already. They just needed a compositor. And it's like why would you write your own compositor when you could when you could just use one that's not that different from what you already had. Now uh, the the trick is for LabWC, uh, and a lot of distros do this, is that when they is that when you install uh, LabWC, it comes w- it comes expecting a Swedish keyboard input by default. What? Yeah. So, um, what kind of keyboard do Swedes have? Where the important question: Where is the Z and why? I don't uh, actually is know. What Z or is it is it still QWERTY but with some like weird characters on it? Because I know. Doesn't Germany use QWERTY by default? Yeah, uh, a lot of Europe uses QWERTY, including Balkan, which means my keyboard. It appears to be QWERTY with umlauts at near the enter. <laughs> yeah, like it was just a, it was just familiar enough that I that I I, I could get away with it, but you know, like uh. It took me. It took me like a few key. I couldn't enter like my password for like my super user account at all. <laughs> Why not? Because <laughs> uh, some of the keys are in different places too, <laughs> compared to like uh, my standard American ANSI keyboard, <laughs> which uh, that. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, and uh, I don't know like the differences specifically. Like uh, it, and that's just because uh, it uses. That's just what the upstream uh, default configuration has, or or maybe it's finished. I can't remember off the top of my head right now. Uh, I could probably like pull up the Git repo and look this up real quick. Uh... You should be able to enter your password and ask you using special characters like I I do use special characters. Th- those that are near enter key those won't work because in Europe we have those completely differently. Yeah, but I'm talking about like punctuation keys. Uh, yeah. Let's yeah, see here, like environment colon and semicolon and shit. Uh, like yeah, they're setting x x k b default layout to s e, which I believe is Swedish. I don't know what the s e keyboard input actually is, uh, but uh, me, yep, it's not U S. So I can tell you that much. It's Swedish. It is Swedish. Okay, so it's I was a- right on that. For most part, it's standard QWERTY, except on the enter key cluster, which is uh, instead of the characters like semicolon uh, and all that stuff, uh, it's it's actually ha- has all om- okay. Umlaut, so like, the uh, the char- uh, characters uh, uh, yeah, are, the are in a different spot. Yeah, umlaut, and uh, that that's what I ran into. But anyways, uh, LabWC is a fantastic project, and uh, I do recommend that you give that a look. Just uh, remember that. Just remember that, that that disclaimer there. Just make sure make sure that you check check that when you when you first launch it, because uh, that that might be that might be a uh, gotcha for you. Because uh, once you're once you're in it, uh, you have to remember that the the right click menu by default does not have a quit option. You have a reload, but you don't have quit. <laughs> do, you, do you remember how you quit? Just Change TTY. You can change TTY, yeah. Well, <laughs> on that point, uh, US keyboard as default always trips me up because, <laughs> again, I use a Quartz keyboard. Well, I'm which sorry. It means just Z and buy y a I $5 US keyboard for configuration. Alternatively, no. just import it from the system. Because <laughs> the current. Like, uh, for example, last time I was setting up was a thing called uh, for a secure boot when you uh, uh, that horrible thing that has uh, it doesn't TPM? matter. 
not TPM, the uh, when you want to add a secure boot key and the thing opens up when you boot, what's it called? Oh, uh, I don't actually know. This be what we do in half this episode, we, we Google stuff. Yeah, uh, <laughs> this might get cut off or might not. Let's you mentioned um, M O K M O K M O K. That only works with US keyboard. Mm -hmm. Now try yep, to yep, yep. enter a dash because <laughs> right, right, on right, my right. Keyboard, I don't have a problem with it. <laughs> on my keyboard, <laughs> dash is right next to shift mm -hmm. on, on the on the right side. It's just a normal mm -hmm. press on US keyboard. It's somewhere in that cluster, but nowhere near there. So. Mm -hmm. I can either use the... it, it's second from backspace. Yeah. You're mentioning sanity. um you're mentioning Waybox before. I think th there's a big difference between not being developed on Wayland and not being developed on X11. Like you can go and use a 20-year-old window manager on X11 and it's going to work assuming you can compile it just fine. It's going to work basically the same way because X11 really hasn't had any major feature changes. For a long time. But something on Wayland, if it's like... If it hasn't been updated in a year, two years, there are really critical protocols that were not a thing yet. Like, just um, just the other day, uh, Gnome finally got XDG session management merged. Uh, this is going to be the protocol for session restore. KDE got it merged a while ago, and it's like got some experimental stuff in KDE for like, doing session restore. And they're kind of just waiting on the GTK side to really flesh that out. But we're going to get to a point fairly soon where you can kill your entire desktop and it comes back and all your windows, for the most part, are going to be opened uh, as they should. But if you have a compositor that isn't updated, like, you just might not have that. Or there's the, the recent WL Roots protocol for... Um, like the improved way of doing screen capture without going through portals. That got merged like a few weeks ago. So if yeah. you're on something that's like a year out of date, you're not going to have that. Or like, you know, screen tearing or any of, of these other little things. Like being a few years out of date on Wayland is way, way worse. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, that's why I don't recommend that you use Waybox. So you just use yeah, LabWC yeah. anyway. That but. Is kind of the benefit of the X11 model, but... Mm -hmm. and this well, is it's not even the part. X11 model, it's just the fact that it's 40 years old. No, it's the X11 model where the display server brings the features, sure, not sure. the compositor. Okay, that's fair. But, on the other hand, that also kind of limits it in many ways and kind of make, kind of forces everybody in the same mold. Whereas mm -hmm. with Wayland, you are just reading a set of specifications and then mm -hmm. writing something based on that, which can be better, depending mm -hmm. on who you ask. And, but I, I also don't agree with the people who complain that's a problem. I think it's a feature, not a, not a bug. Yeah, and uh, honestly, like... Uh... I think that uh, it's it's nice that it's nice that Wayland gave us like this opportunity to just have like a complete clean approach. Uh, I know that there have definitely been some issues with like uh, convincing Wayland maintainers that hey we want this thing. Uh, I have read those email lists just like you have, Brody, where it's just like uh, you get that one Wayland guy that per that uh, per that uh, makes it completely out of this world argument as to why they should not <laughs> implement this thing and he just so happens to be like be a core core member so he can just say that hey i don't support this thing let's kill it <laughs> it's gotten a lot better for sure um it really has and it, uh, like i i think we've got some new faces in the wayland space and i think a big part that's really changed stuff is having the addition of more desktops like when it was basically just KDE and Gnome go at each other's throats for, and then like W Roots would be there. Usually they would opt for something more, <coughs> like, what would say, like more more open, right? 
Gnome is going to do the Gnome thing. If it doesn't work, in, if, it, if it's not a use case in Gnome, then we just don't want to support it. Um, but now that there is Cosmic involved in discussions and Murr is coming back as well. So I don't know if you've seen the um, merger oh. requirements for how like a protocol gets like into the Wayland spec. But I think it was... I think they need three implementations and three acts for the main space. I, it could be four, but now you can have parties like Western not get involved at all, and parties like Gnome not get and not get involved at all, and it's it still manages to get pushed through, which might cause issues in the long run with it being maybe like you know kind of this weird split where you have. You have the Wayland spec, but a lot of desktops are just not implementing core parts of it. They're, they're well, actually, the, the, to my opinion, that isn't actually a problem. That all the desktops, all the options, don't actually implement every single spec. Mm -hmm. That's actually not a problem. That's yeah, kind of kind of the point. Mm -hmm. Which I think that's like a benefit for Way Wayland too, where it's like the these uh, desktops, these compilers, they can, they can just choose not to implement that protocol. Uh, therefore, like yeah. any application that would expect that protocol probably just won't work. But yeah. that's uh, the application not working is not the compositor's fault. And in uh, theory, this would also mean they could bring their own protocol, and with that, uh, make it, and then once it's implemented whether it's something that could be used by more, they could bring a working version of it in front of other people instead of hoping it gets implemented into and gets pushed into X11 because otherwise there is no point in creating it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, that's something that, that like the Hyperlane project ha has done where uh, I where they, they've come out with like alternative utilities in like the WL root space and uh, they at one point, like, uh, somebody was even proposing, like, their hypercursor actually being becoming the Wayland default for how cursors are handled, because, I'll, I'll be honest with you, Vactory did a very good job with that. But, of course, uh, there's a whole rabbit, rabbit, rabbit case and story behind that one that uh, I don't want to necessarily cover on this podcast. Mm -hmm. But, uh, as to why that didn't, didn't actually come around... Uh, if you want to look look into that, I'm certain that you could probably find like videos from like other uh, people that that have discussed it before. Well, but it's not it's not necessarily that the protocols um, not going to be used. I think there's there's still like work being done on it. Um, they're just using like a modified version of it. There's the discussion in KDE is still open about it. That's what I can say. Okay, well, uh, that that's good. That you know, uh, it's going to be at least a cr it's going to be cross platform from like uh, Wayland in the Wayland desktop space. Uh, that there's an agreed upon protocol because uh, mm. I'll be honest with you, the current implementation is not nice. Because mm. <laughs> you know, uh, sometimes it's like I'll be hovering over a window that's running an X Wayland, and I get a completely different cursor than what I have on my Wayland windows. And if I'm if I hover from like a QT window to a GTK window, I still I get even a, another cursor. And at some point, try just doing that with containers. You yeah, see how, how cursors work. And yeah, it, an it, annoying issue. It, it, it's a mess, sense. and uh, I'll, I'll be perfectly happy when, you know, uh, there, there is a standard that everything can just implement. So, uh, I, I'm glad that we're looking into that. Now, uh, of course, we have gone a little long here, so uh, mm. we'll, we'll, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and bring the uh, show to, towards our end here. Now, of course... Uh, if you are the if you are the listener for this here, and uh, mm. say that you are new to our show, uh, our show has a very unique feature that a lot of podcasts don't have. Uh, that is called our podcast runs on a mostly self-hosted infrastructure, which basically gives us a lot of freedom to do what we want with our show. Uh, at, as a result, we don't have like these fancy algorithms uh, that uh, you know go out and recommend recommend us to like these other. Uh, uh, to like listeners we don't show up on like a pod pa podcast recommendation feed in your podcast app on spotify uh we d we do show up in the database but we're not but spotify doesn't host our show so uh as default like the best way for us to grow our show is by you a, a listener finding value in our show and recommending it to other <coughs> people uh, that is the that is our fastest method to, method to growth to, to growth and i really do encourage that 
And if you would like to, and because we are self-hosted, you have to realize that even though like the current cost of hosting our show is cheap, uh, as our show grows, it's going to get more expensive. So, uh, because you know we are hosting this, and bandwidth it, bandwidth costs money. Same with storage; those are the two most expensive things that we could possibly be paying for. And uh, even though I can float the bills for that right now, uh, there's a there's a potential future where you know we might just hit like. 200,000 downloads, which I know Big Pot's going to be totally excited to see that happen. Ah, but, uh, you know, I'm not going to be too to happy. I'm going to have to scale the servers. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so he's going to have to work on the scale, and I'm going to have to, like, pull out more, more, more on money. Work on the scale of your wallet. wallet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, if you would like to help in this endeavor and help us hedge for, like, that inevitable future, well, potentially inevitable future, uh, you can go to patreon.com slash no tucks allowed. And, uh, you know, give us a couple of dollars. Uh, we, we currently have a couple tiers. Uh, and you know what? If you if you give up, give us that if you uh, give us some amount of money, uh, we we will actually give you a special podcast feed as well that gets you a higher quality audio. Uh, multiple and, times you know, the bit rate. Yeah, it's mul- it's multiple times the bit rate, which uh, if you're listening to this in your podcast client, uh, we actually serve a higher bit rate than most podcasts to begin with. So w- w- theoretically, we're a higher production quality audio uh, c- compared to like uh, Joe Rogan, who uh, broadcasts his his podcast in in se- seventy two kilohertz. And fun to, fact, yeah. <laughs> but anyways, seventy two megabit, my friend. Yeah, megabit per and second, you know, not we're, kilohertz. Uh, we we are probably going to. Uh, uh, have like additional features in that RSS feed in the future, you know, like unique content as well. But of course, as as we work on growing the show here and we get like feedback from the audience, uh, uh, we we can actually grow onto that. You know, we're just like we might discuss like a cool application that we discovered, or you know, you might listen to us mess around with like an AI chatbot, like a uh, big pot and I did for like two hours before a certain episode, yeah. where uh, we discovered a uh, Una AI, which is a self hosted girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> that that was a fun experiment, but you know, uh, and you know, uh, I look forward to see to see like the stu- the stuff that we come out with with this show. And of course, if you would like to get if there's something that we said that uh, you disagree with or that you don't like, you can always send us an angry email. We mm-hmm. we have this wonderful email address that's going to show up on the screen right now. Uh, you can send us an email to contact at tuckspace dot com. Uh, that is an email address that uh, you would send an email to that would then automatically forward to uh, myself and Big Pod, where uh, we we may or may not uh, give you the benefit of a response. I know uh, so far I've been uh, pretty responsive in all in all the emails. I don't know about you, Big Pod, but uh, at, at least I know I have. Now, if you need to reach us independently, uh, we have these contact links that would be showing up on the screen here if you're watching the video version. Of which uh, uh, this will all be linked in the show notes as well. Uh, you'll see like these fancy links that say like at one zero l e j or at big pod at like some some web address. Those are federation links for like your uh, is it Instagram Mastodon. threads or uh, yeah yeah is it Instagram in- threads if if you're yeah, living Instagram, in the US. Instagram threads if you have federation enabled or if you use Mastodon. Uh, the, that's what those links are for. You put those in there, you can fo- you can fo- pull our profiles up directly. Uh, e- I'll even have Brody's linked in the in description as well because you know I know he posts on Mastodon because you know I happen to be a stalker of his. Uh, of course, we've also got our own individual YouTube channels. Uh, I'll be having uh, by the time this episode drops, I'll have a fancy new video out there uh, where you know we're discussing like hardware considerations for, for like our home lab services because you know I'm still working on that series. <laughs> and I might have one as well by that time. And and of course, a guy that actually knows how to hit the upload button on his YouTube channel, uh, Brody's definitely going to have like 14 videos by the time mine publishes. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I but, just handle uh, everything way ahead of time. Yeah, and, <laughs> and Brody, I, I know I kind of just like put your Mastodon link in there as well as like your YouTube link, but is there any other platforms like you want people to shout very angrily at you at? Uh, those is probably uh, the easiest thing. Uh, yeah, Twitter, Mastodon, whatever. Feel free to be angry wherever you want to be. I'll probably block you. <laughs> Just be be angry but kind about it. <laughs> or, or usually, I like to push people's buttons. Reasonable. Just see, like, be reasonable. 
<laughs> yeah, you, you you could just get super angry at me. I I personally won't care because I just <laughs> I just follow a no block but ignore policy. <laughs> yeah, that that definitely works. Give him the silent treatment. Yep, that that's what I do. It, it's worked perfectly fine for like fourteen years for me on uh, with my time on the internet. But anyways, guys, uh, that's gonna be it for the show. Uh, we will see you next week. Goodbye. Bye.